It's a 2015 F-250 with a 6.7 liter. And the customer states, check engine light came on, is now off, but it did come on. They were concerned, so they brought it in. Showing 10,422 miles. So let's get the scan tool on it and uh, <clears throat> see what the code is. If there is a code. Wires drive me nuts. All right, good old Windows 8. All right, so. Uh, being a, uh, a mechanic, you got to be a detective sometimes. So we've had this truck in the shop. Uh, what is going on down at the bottom down there? Hang on. <clears throat> so as I was saying, this truck's been in the shop before and been hooked to the scan tool because the previous screen showed the the vehicle's being ID'd. So, this may be related, may not be related. Alright, so we've got a P04DB, and that is crankcase ventilation system disconnected. Um, we've got some freeze frame data, which, you know, the only useful tool that's going to be for is knowing exactly what conditions set the code, or when the code set, what the conditions were. In this case, one second after the vehicle was started. The, the light, this code set. So, I mean, that, that doesn't tell us anything. So, that's useless information. Although, if you look here, this is pretty cool. It was 80 degrees out, and the engine oil temperature is 82 degrees. So, um, and here's our detective work. In the past, we cleared a P0107 map low and a P0108 map high. Now, this is a used car, belongs to us. Sales manager was demoing it. That's when the light came on on them. So these codes are, they don't mean anything. Uh, you know, if a shop were to look at this, they really wouldn't know what's going on. They'd be, holy cow, we got some really, really uh, bad map issues. However, the fact that you got a code for low and high, uh, that would, you wouldn't have that in the rear out in the field on a typical failure uh, so we were using this vehicle as a guinea pig uh, we just pulled it off the lot because we had another truck that had a programmer in it and we were unplugging the map sensor and plugging it back in and and doing collecting some data to see because we we're having troubles with the truck with the programmer so that's why you have a low code and a high code I mean you know we were jumping out the the connector to see how the sensor would, you know, the computer would respond and, you know, disconnected it. So, I mean, that that's that's a red flag. If you were to see two codes in the same session uh, that, you know, from a previous repair, there would be a clear indicator that uh, somebody was probably just tinkering with it. Um, and we were doing some tinkering. 
So, let's, uh, let's find out what this is all about. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to make this out when this video is rendered, but let's go into the shop manual and look up this code. Let's see here, it was a P04DB. So we'll just hit control control F. P04DB. Let the computer find it for us. And it says this DTC sets when the crankcase ventilation sensor voltage drops below 2.5 volts. Possible goals is Vehicle buffered power voltage buffered power circuit open. Um, and then go to pinpoint test C. So let's look at the wiring diagram, see what this thing looks like. Uh, from just a few videos I've uploaded here recently, I've made a determination that uh, audio. It's pretty bad when I'm in front of the phone, so you probably will not be looking at me in this video, just so you can hear my voice. Our wiring diagram does not want to load. This computer is, uh, there we go. She's a little iffy. Alright, 67 diesel. And I believe this is on the really close to the last page oh yeah she's glitchy <clears throat> let's see here I can barely read this. I'm closer than the phone is. Of course, I'm half blind. All right, so there's our sensor. So let's blow this up a little bit. I'll slide this over. And this is a, you know, if you were to look at the sensor and look it up and read all about it, it's a Hall Effect sensor. So we've got buffered power comes into our sensor and then our signal return our ground uh, so one in three the outside pins on the connector are going to be power and ground and then our signal is going to be the middle pin which is yellow all right and uh, you know hall effect sense switches sensors are they're great for detecting position um, and this is what we're this is how they're determining if the um, crankcase vent hose has come off, somebody's tampered with it. Uh, it's an emissions component now. You know, in the old days, you just had a draft tube um, and you just pumped out all the crankcase vapors and misty oil and crap right out onto the highway. The government didn't like that, so now you gotta put it back into the engine to be burned. Um, but it gets a lot of oil vapor carryover, especially if your engine's getting some wear on it. So people disconnect them, they'll take them off and put filters in them just to keep the oil out of the turbo and out of the charge air cooler system and, and whatnot. Um, so, you know, it's really kind of hard to have a switch on there. It's just a round tube that connects to a component. So some smart engineer, uh, really was thinking outside the box and they said we'll put a hall effect sensor on there and it, you know it'll it'll detect if it's connected or not via um you know being in contact with the sensor and I'll, we'll look at that in a minute um the hall effect sensors are you know i'm used to uh just from being around for a while um 
you know, right, they use them in everything. I mean, they put them on seat tracks. They don't know how close the seat is back and forth to the airbag. Um, bobcat skid steers, they have them on the, the, the lap bar to know if the bar is up or down. Uh, ride height sensors on, uh, you know, air suspension. Uh, really good way to detect, but I'm used to like a pickup and a distributor. Uh, so you'll have a, uh, you know, the sensor and then a magnet on the other, the opposite side of it. And then you'll just have a, you know, a disc rolling between it that'll have windows. So when it blocks the, the signal from the magnet, you know, your sensor goes higher, or lower, however it's wired. And then when the wind, there's a window comes into it, then it'll pick the signal up again and it can detect rotation. Uh, so it's good for you know cam sensors, crank sensors, what have you. And in this case, uh, we're just using it to know if the component is together. So if you pull it apart, uh, you know it's kind of like a straight-on uh, magnet. Uh, excuse me, uh, pickup. If you have it connected, then it's gonna the voltage is gonna be in this case high. And if you disconnect it, then there, there's nothing inside the sensor to read. And it's going to go low. Uh, I think it's stated. If it drops below two and a half volts. Yeah. So we don't know what the voltage is going to it is. Um, we'll check it. And we're not really interested though. We're just interested in looking at that signal voltage. So let's see what our data shows for the sensor. So we can just simply go to data logger, uh, powertrain, engine. And deselect all. And then we'll go to crankcase vent hose voltage. Simple enough. And we read 3.59 volts. Not sure if you can see that. So the test they want you to do, they want you to check for power to the sensor, ground to the sensor, and then the signal. And they want to know if the signal changes if you disconnect the sensor from the intake manifold. All right. Um, IDS will can it'll automatically configure the way it thinks you want to look at things, and that's fine looking at the voltage number. However, it's it's hard to read. If I go out and disconnect that thing, I mean I got to really be looking at that number. But if I change it to a graph, then it's you know it's a little easier to see. So to do that, let's see, you go over here to you select it first. So if we were out here then we're not selected. There's only one. So it's got to have a border around it. So we select it. And if you deselect it, you lose all this stuff over here. So we select it. And then we got fingers and whatnot. And we'll click, select this finger here. And it brings this screen up. Ah, this mouse is so sensitive. And we're going to click on a graph. Right now, we're defaulted to a numerical value. We can use a graph, we can use a histogram, or a bar. We're gonna select graph. <clears throat> Excuse me, we can also change the voltage. We can make the voltage whatever we want, uh, all the way up to 64 volts. Uh, right now we're set at 15 volts. That's what this bar is set at. So we can bring it down to 10, or 13 if you wanted to. And then we can set our recording, recording limits to trigger. So let's click that. And now we got this nice little bar here, or this nice little graph. So if we go out and disconnect it, we'll be able to see right away a change in that. So let's go out under the hood. All right, so we're back under the hood and sensor in question. So if we pan out, get a relationship. This is the upper intake and the uh, charge air cooler hot hose. If we pan in, this is the sensor. All right, it's hooked to the hose, and the hose goes under and over 
to our crankcase vent separator. This is right there with the number two labels on it. So our vapors come out and go into the engine. And if that were to become disconnected, then we'll set a code. So let's disconnect it and see what our voltage does. Alright, this just got a twist lock on it. So you basically just twist the hose, the collar. Let's just twist and then you can pop it right off of there. And then, uh, you barely, barely caught it, but uh, the voltage did drop. So. The connector is here, all right, connects into here, and this is our little converter box, converts the, the analog signal that's going to be created, and you get a nice wavy-davy signal, um, but the computer wants a crisp digital signal, so this will convert uh, the sensor operation into a squared off, nice, crisp, crisp clean signal. Alright, so let's uh, hmm, let's stick something metal in there and simulate it. So this is just an old shaft out of a you know an older style uh, distributorless pickup and I can just simply insert this into the sensor and as I do the voltage should change on the meter or uh, the scan tool. So right now the sensor is disconnected and we're reading 1.55 volts. And if I put the tool in here, then we jump back up to our 3.59. I see is if I just take this in and out, I mean I'm picking up the signal. So that tells me the <coughs> sensor has power and ground, and that's okay. It's not shorted, it's not open, and the signal wire it's complete back to the PCM because we're seeing what the PCM is seeing. So in this case, the next step is to actually replace the sensor. So one interesting note, uh, for this thing to work, you know, magnetism is involved, but this connects to the lower intake, which is aluminum. However, the connection port ferrous so they've just pressed a piece of you know ferrous metal into the intake for our sensor hose to connect to all right so when they originally released the 6.7 liter in 2011 this is the the hose here on an 11 and this is the sensor wire hall effect sensor and this is the quick release connection I was talking about uh, the original one didn't you know you could take the hose right off of the the separator that was that was bolted to the valve cover I guess one day an engineer was talking to another engineer and they said hey um, the whole idea here is to monitor this connection to make sure this hose doesn't get you know disconnected um, what about this side you can just simply Disconnect it. It's got a quick release on it. And they said, "Ah, yeah. Looks like uh, we looks like we got to redo this." And unfortunately, they did. And this is what they did. So it'd be kind of foolish to put two sensors, the software to read the two sensors. So they simply kept this connection the same because you got to be able to disconnect it, get it apart. But then they made this permanent. So now to replace this sensor, you got to get the whole entire box. And they're back to being able to monitor if this has become disconnected or not. <clears throat> Which is actually a good thing for us as mechanics because let's say we had this motor all apart and it's easy to do. Uh, forgot to connect this. Well, on a post test drive, uh, this is going to fly a code pretty quickly. 
Uh, when you come back, check, make sure you don't have any problems or codes or leaks or anything. You're going to see it, realize your mistake, be able to connect it, and the customer doesn't get mad because they have to come back. You save yourself a lot of headache. Um, what else have I got to say about this? Oh, as far as the, the diagnostics on what we're just doing, <clears throat> now obviously a lab scope would be the best way to check this, um, but it's, it's overkill. It's not really necessary with uh, a scan tool that can read that in a graphing form, um, even a graphing multimeter. Um, you know, if you're at home, you went to AutoZone, pulled this code, and then went home and you had a, a voltmeter, you could do the same check. You would just back pro the middle wire and look for that voltage. Anything below 2.5 volts is a problem. If you disconnect it, it drops down to you know one volt, one and a half volt, and you plug it back in, it's over two and a half, um, then this is no good. And these fail. I mean, this you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Uh, this will fail a lot more than the harness or the computer, um, especially if you know nobody's messed with the vehicle, did any aftermarket wiring or anything like that. So, I mean, there's you know, a lot of ways to check this. Uh, I, I'm at a dealer, so it's easy for me to hook the IDS up. And that's basically, if I put a, if I were to put a lab scope on it, I would have saw the exact same graph. Um, so, now let's put this on the truck. All right, I figured, uh, I'll just hook up a voltmeter real quick before we tear this apart and demonstrate uh, if you didn't have any special equipment. This is regular old blue point voltmeter, nothing special. And I am back probed into the middle pin on our connector and we're disconnected and we're reading 1.56 volts which is you know, what we had on the scan tool. And I've just got an old oxygen sensor here. I'm going to stick it down in the hole and she jumps up to three and a half volts. So let's see here. <clears throat> so we got three and a half. I'll take it out. We have 1.56. So that simulates plugging it back up. So. There again, that checks your your integrity on your power and ground to the sensor and the ability for the sensor to read at the sensor only in this particular case. Now we don't know, doing this particular test, we wouldn't know if, if this signal was actually getting back to the PCM or not. But, um, I mean, you could go to the PCM and, and check the same way with using the voltmeter, but I just wanted to demonstrate, you know, how simple a circuit it is. Alright, so it's nice if you got the new part in hand, uh, especially if it's kind of buried and hard to get to. Um, then you can figure out where your fasteners are. So, we got one here, one there, one here, one there, and it sits on two O-rings, which it comes with. So we have an O-ring here, and an O-ring here. Um, this is the actual oil drain. So, I mean, this is a mess. When you take this thing off the valve cover, oil runs everywhere. Uh, I'm, I'm not even gonna try to contain the mess. Uh, it's, just, it's just too, it's too aggravating. Plus, I gotta take these fuel lines off. So, I mean, it's just, it's just gonna be a mess no matter what I do. We'll clean it all up when we get done. But, uh, those bolts are way back in the back. And this top bolt here, and then the bolt down at the bottom here is actually a stud. And the fuel lines are in the way, so I'll unbolt those and move them out of the way. And uh, let me see if I can prop you up where you can see this.
found it healthy. Neighbors are cutting my grass. tool kind of guy, rarely ever use air tools, especially in close quarters like this. I'm dropping everything. Trying to pull heads off. Those two bolts hold the fuel. I doubt you guys are getting any of this, but keep on taping this thing please. Keep on keeping on. So this is the bottom stud. I unbolted the fuel lines, get them out of the way. That is a 10 millimeter. Working on a Duramax. So that's that. I believe I would rather pick up cans in the street than work on Duramaxes. Everybody I talk to, they don't do a lot to them, but service them, they don't really break down. Fords, man, I, I made every house payment I've ever made off of Fords. So that's a 10, no stud. I'll take the back two out. See if we can't sneak this thing out of here. Those look like 10s. Let me get a swivel. So to get into the back back there, I've got a quarter inch swivel. These are expensive. And I've got a really long extension with a locking collar so I don't lose my junk. There's no way you can see what I'm doing, even I wanted to show you, so pop these two bolts out and I'll see if uh, something happens here. Mustang that you put the axle seals in. Yeah. I've always complained about a noise. Uh -huh. I don't know if they had that noise before you weren't on or laughing. I've, I've never heard the mystery noise. Uh -huh. Are you filming yourself? I am. I'll edit you out though. Anyway, I just uh, heard it. What is it? I rode with the customer. Yeah? Uh -huh. Just the clutches in the rear end. Did you put the brakes modifier back in? Sure did. Okay. It probably wore out. Huh? They probably wore out. That's what I told them, but I wanted to make sure you put the modifier in there first. What's what's the noise? Want to ride with me? No. Yeah. What's the noise? You just have to listen to it. Yeah. They won't put tires on the damn car. I'm not interested in doing anything to the car. The clutch is lined up. So you got to be turning? Uh -huh. See, I never drove. I drove straight ahead. Listen That's to the front brake noise. I was told it would do it at 45 miles an hour. <laughs> they want to put clutches in it? I 
Alright, so unfortunately I dropped the damn bolt. Unfortunately I have that bolt dropped. So we'll uh, fish that out when we get this thing apart. Here. Slide this around. That's that's what we're after. I'll just pop that up. Put that ground wire out of the way. Free. A little closer view of what we're working with. So that back port is uh, vapor, comes into the box, and this front port, as you can see from all the oil in it, that is the drain back to the sump. There's a whole lot of baffles in there, baffles everywhere because we don't want crankcase pressure coming back up through there. We don't want crankcase pressure to come through there. So, now I've got to round up that bolt I dropped, and I had a cover on that open fuel line there, but I dropped it, I knocked it off when I was taking the port out, or the box out, so I'll cover that back up, and put this thing back on. So if you're to read the shot manual procedure on this job, it says not to lubricate these O-rings, which I find very odd as to why you do not want to lubricate the O-rings. Now luckily, it's kind of a tragedy, but all our emission label and injector quantity codes are uh, no longer on this engine. Was replacing the box that the labels were bolted to. It's terrible. Alright. I have no idea what this looks like on camera. And there she is. Our glory. Building my ship in a bottle skills. derailing the camera here.
about as close as I can get in here to film. I apologize. There's two. Believe it or not, these are easy. Saving the hard one for last. Get everything started before we tighten anything down. Got them down somewhat close. Lock it down. <clears throat> Put a little stress on them and the angles a little awkward. Too bad. I did make a uh, error. Let me show you that in a minute. There's a heat wrap. Why they couldn't put the thing on from the factory, I don't know. It comes with the box. I forgot to put it on. So now I gotta try to put it on after the fact, which is no big deal. It's just Pain in the neck. Could have did it on the bench. It's been super easy. All right. So that's all tight. Now we can put the fuel filter back in it. Get some ground wire back up. Actually, I guess I'll have to put that sleeve on first. Let me show you that sleeve. I guess it's more of a wrap. It's just this piece of tin foil. It goes around the back corner over here at the top because the exhaust manifolds are up in the valley instead of on the sides. So. That was my mistake. Got in a hurry. Now I can take this cover off here. Keep the crud out of the fuel system. Put this line back on. 
and this line around it's still connected I'll just connect that to here push that down to lock it comes the other fuel line Pop these off. And these just simply push on, clip in, clip on. I'll spray those off with some brake cleaner. Clean all the fuel up. We don't have any leak, proposed leaks. I'm not going to film putting this on because it's, you know, it's just in the back. It's hard to get to. You're not going to be able to see anything and there will probably be some cussing involved. So, all right. So, next step is to uh, clear the code and take it for a pop. I guess we better hook that up, right? So, plug all this in, hook it back up, and we'll take this thing for a road. So I almost forgot to plug up the part I was replacing to begin with for the whole problem. It really a problem because it's in. Let me find that connector. How in the world did they get down there? that be that give her the old wiggle shake make sure she doesn't come unplugged and we're good all right so I'm wrapping up this uh, job and I did put the, uh, the shielding insulation shielding on there to match that that's keep the heat of the turbo off there and I actually Went in and peeled the stickers off the old box, and they didn't survive too great, but the most important sticker on here is this one, and I just put some clear packing tape on it. Uh, you know, if this, fact, this being a factory engine and factory equipped with all the fuel system, it's just easier to read these numbers here than to try to get them elsewhere, uh, off the injectors or whatnot. Um, could have did a little neater job if I did this when it was on the bench, but I forgot all about it. All right, I'll do my uh, little Jerry Springer closing thoughts. Um, the, the last steps I'm going to do, I'm going to clear the codes, uh, clear the code that was in the vehicle, and um, I'm going to put over on the lift and clean off all the oil that's spilled, um, get that back factory, you know, nice and clean, and then just go drive it, make sure nothing crops back up, recheck it for codes, and then we're going to be done with it. The uh, As far as this repair goes, um, we never really verified, you know, they had a checking light on with the code, but we never, it's always, you know, a problem, you know, a little iffy when you come up with a diagnosis and you replace something and you don't see an actual broken part. You, you take it apart and there's just nothing to look at, no carnage. So there's always in the back of your mind are you on the right track. Now, if this were customer pay, you can go, go, go about it a little differently. You could, uh, most customers I know uh, that I've dealt with, if you know, you charge them for your checkout time, but you could say, hey, we get, got a code for this part, and it, it could be really expensive. Who knows what it costs? Uh, we put on and uh, see what happens, or you can, we can clear the code and you can drive it, especially if you live locally. And if the light comes back on, we'll, we'll recheck and see if the code's cropped back up. You know. 
and just you know carry that labor over it won't be an extra charge um, most people I know would opt for that route they don't want to put five six hundred dollar part on just to see what happens so in the description of the code um, we could actually have you know a power problem to that sensor so basically a correct working system that solar or that sensor is going to read three and a half volts if we dip below 2.5 we're going to set the code if you mechanically disconnect the part you're going to drop down to we showed a volt and a half that's going to trip your code um, if you disconnect the sensor electrically then the voltage is going to top, top out at 5 volts and you'll set a totally different code you'll set a high circuit code or something like that um, which is totally different from a mechanical disconnect um, so if you lose your ground signal to the sensor that signal goes to all the kind of grades of other sensors you'd have a gaggle of codes I mean you have codes out the wazoo if you lose your power signal then you're going to drop down to around 2 volts you're going to be below 2.5 you're going to set the exact same code um, as a mechanical disconnect so in essence we could have a power problem or a sensor problem or it disconnected in this case it wasn't disconnected and I've checked the wiring you know I didn't take the harness off and open it up and look at every section of wire but the chances of having that one wire bad it's it's just it's slim and we've seen a lot of these sensors go out in the past so we're gonna roll with that all right thank you for reviewing Uh, one final note, I was talking about the, in 2011 they came out with a setup. Um, if you look closely at that section of video, you might notice that that sensor has nothing in it. It's just a cavity, there's no, there's nothing in the, uh, you know, it's just like an open section of plastic with nothing in there. There's no wires, no terminals in there. Um, late 11 they, they started using it, however, I just looked at a 12 model and it still didn't have it. And if it doesn't incorporate the sensor, the sensor's there, the wiring's there, then the PID won't be in the, you won't have the availability to look at the PID. And uh, so far the ones I've seen are the ones that you can disconnect from both sides. So evidently when they came out with the disconnect and it permanently attached to the, the crankcase ventilation box is when they started using the, uh, the software to monitor it. So kind of interesting, kind of null and voids, everything I said about, uh, you know, having two engineers argue about if you can disconnect it on both ends, why monitor one end, so anyway, little, uh, little afterthought there.